Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, or TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Allison Glaser. I'm a PhD candidate and program manager in the Division of Health Behavior and Health Promotion in the College of Public Health at Ohio State University. TOPS is organized by Catherine McLean from Temple University, Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, Si Shang from the Ohio State University, and Mike Pesco from Georgia State University. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from those questions and comments in the conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments, and please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines uh, will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they're not read aloud and your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. So I'll turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Si Shang from Ohio State University to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Allison. Um, today we kick off our spring 2022 season with a single paper presentation by Dr. Lauren Hin Velasco entitled The Long-Term Impact of Early Life, Cigarette Taxes on Adult Pre-Pregnancy and Prenatal Smoking. Lauren Hin Velasco is an assistant professor in the Department of Economics at Georgia State University. She is an applied microeconomist focusing on public economics and health economics. She has several areas of work, including the long-term effects of public programs, the role of public health in epidemiological transition, and the recent household level impacts of unilateral divorce and COVID-19 public health measures in Mexico. Dr. Hin Velasco earned her PhD in economics from Boston College in 2018 and her bachelor's degree in mathematics and economics from Michigan State University. Dr. Michael Pesco from Georgia State University is a co-author of the study and will answer select Q&As. Our discussion today is Dr. Catherine McLean. Dr. Hin Velasco, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you so much and thank you for selecting me for this uh, presentation. And as was said, I'll be presenting on the long-term impact of early life cigarette taxes on adult pre-pregnancy and prenatal smoking. And this is joint with Mike Pesco and then Serena, Serena Phillips as well. So before we get started, I just wanna mention the relevant disclosure. So this research uh, was supported by the NIH Institute on Drug Abuse and the views in this study do not necessarily reflect the NIH. Uh, in the past 10 years, I have no other tobacco related conflicts besides the mentioned funding for the study. So to start off, the main question in the study that we're getting at is, do early life public policies impact long-term health behaviors? So we know a lot in the literature about prenatal and early childhood environment and how that's crucial for human capital development, particularly in childhood, and then also the long-term effects into adult human capital. But if early life influences also impact health behaviors, that's sort of a, another potential avenue for early childhood health to persist into an adulthood. And this is something that's sort of been understudied in the literature is the, the long-term effect of early life public policies on particularly health behaviors. So in this study, we're asking, do higher early life cigarette taxes have a long-term intergenerational effect on adult smoking behavior? So we're gonna focus on cigarette taxes that are in place during the in utero development of the adults of focus. And we're gonna be focusing on whether these in utero cigarette taxes or higher cigarette taxes have a long-term link to adult smoking behavior. We're gonna focus particularly on adult prenatal smoking. And so really what we're doing in this paper is we're looking at indirect exposure to cigarette taxes. So we're looking at does exposure in utero have a long-term effect on whether adults smoke, in particular mothers. So this is indirect exposure by current mothers. So when they're prenatally pregnant with a current child, do those mothers, do the cigarette taxes that were in place when they were in utero faced by their grandmothers, do those, have a, do those taxes have a long-term effect on smoking behavior? So it's really indirect exposure instead of direct exposure, which is usually the focus of the literature looking at cigarette taxes. So prenatal smoking, why look at prenatal smoking? There's a few reasons. So prenatal smoking remains an ongoing public health threat. 
It's been shown to raise the likelihood of pregnancy complications, for instance, low birth weight. It also uh, has long-term implications for health and human capital development. And then prenatal smoking is well reported as an administrative record in the birth certificates. And so administrative re records are really nice because they include a large, very large sample. And then uh, we know that it's been recorded sort of on a medical record. Um, and so it's a little bit more uh, interesting than, than just survey data. Um, and the birth certificates also provide a really nice piece of information, which is the mother's birth state. So we can link mothers from their current pregnancies back to their birth state. And we can say, what was the tax regime in place in the state that the mother was born? And so that's where we're getting identification. It's based on the mother's birth state that we observe during the current mother's delivery uh, of her infant. Okay, so how do we do this? What do we go about? Uh, doing in this paper. So we're going to look at prenatal smoking, which I mentioned, which comes from the U.S. birth certificates. We're going to look at early life taxes. So these are taxes in place during the mother's own gestation, which are based on where she was born. So these mothers are going to be in utero from 1965 to 2000. And then we're observing their smoking patterns from 2009 until 2020. So the variation in cigarette taxes is coming from 1965 to 2000. And then we're observing their smoking behavior over 2009 to 2020. And we're gonna use a fixed effect model. So we're gonna control for uh, the time fixed effect. So when is the current pregnancy conceived? Um, when was the mother herself conceived? And we're gonna include fixed effects for those years and then month years. And then we'll include uh, location fixed effects. So we'll have the mother's birth state fixed effects and then the current resident state fixed effects. So where she lives uh, today. And then we'll also include linear trends for the mother's birth state and conception year. So this is gonna control for cohort specific changes and smoking patterns over time. Um, and then the main sort of policy that we're using is this uh, early life cigarette tax. And we'll also, we'll look at both the level of the tax and then we also look at changes in taxes as a robustness. So what do we find? We find that higher state level in utero taxes reduce prenatal smoking in adulthood. Uh, and we primarily focus on first time mothers. Uh, so 1% increase in early life cigarette taxes is associated with a reduction in the probability of prenatal smoking by 0.24%. And then in linear terms, a $1 increase in the cigarette tax is going to reduce prenatal smoking by 2.1 percentage points. So then um, we kind of ask, what are the mechanisms for this effect? So we kind of dig into a number of different mechanisms. Um, and I'll talk about in a second in the background section, I'll talk about why we would expect early life taxes to affect adult smoking. But sort of what we find is that we find the main effect to be probably driven by human capital formation, adult so socioeconomic status, and then potentially health, um, just overall health of the mother. So we find that higher cigarette taxes leading up to the mother's gestation are associated with higher college degree attainment, um, measuring human capital. They're also associated with an increased likelihood of being married at first delivery and a lower likelihood of receiving WIC. So these are gonna capture SES or socioeconomic status. And then we sort of show that SES and human capital also predict uh, smoking behavior. So these are kind of uh, linked together and um, likely the main effect of the cigarette taxes is acting through human capital and SES. We also find uh, multi-generational effects on health and health behaviors. So mother's health is changed. So the mother uh, actually improves in health. She has a lower pre-pregnancy BMI, lower diabetes risk during pregnancy, and an increased likelihood of breastfeeding. And then infant health. So this is sort of third generation exposure to these cigarette taxes. Infant health uh, is also improved where we see a small likelihood of a reduction in very premature, and then a small likelihood and reduction of very low birth weight. So overall, this is sort of telling us that these early life cigarette taxes are improving uh, mother's human capital development and then her overall health, which then even has uh, effects for the third generation of exposure. So something that's sort of uh, interesting in these findings is that we find these are, uh, this analysis is robust to a host of checks, but there's sort of two notable cohort effects that appear in the data. So in our main findings, we find that early life taxes are really important and robust to including both teenage taxes and contemporary taxes. Um, but when 
we look over time. So we kind of step back and say, well, why aren't uh, contemporary taxes and teenage taxes as important, which is what we find in the main results. We find that contemporary taxes and teenage taxes don't seem to be predicting smoking behavior uh, very clearly. So we try to look at a longer time period. So our main sample focuses on 20, 2009 to 2020. So we go back to 1996 and we kind of look at when does this early life uh, cigarette tax, when does this start to look important in the data? And when do contemporary and cigarette taxes seem uh, like they're becoming less important? So what we find is that we find that contemporary taxes and teenage taxes were really important in the uh, early 2000s and the late 1990s, but they sort of decline in importance throughout the 2000s. And early life taxes appear important sort of post 2006. So there's been sort of this shift where early life taxes have recently become an important policy and contemporary and teenage taxes have uh, sort of less influence on smoking behavior today. So we posit that maybe these higher cigarette taxes and early life may have disrupted a generation of smokers and made these individuals less responsive to contemporary taxes today. So it's basically taken out the marginal smokers early in life where they never started smoking to begin with, or uh, these smokers sort of quit earlier in life and they're no longer in the pool of smokers. And so they're less tax responsive or less sensitive to taxes today. And we view this as a potential factor contributing to the decline in contemporary tax responsiveness today that's been observed in related literature. Okay. So to touch on the related literature, that's kind of the overview. I'm gonna give you the related literature and then go into the background uh, section where I'll talk about the mechanisms for why we would expect early life taxes to be important. So cigarette taxes have been shown as quite important during pregnancy and they've also been shown to be impactful for childhood health and achievement. Uh, and there've been a few studies that have looked at sort of in utero exposure to cigarette taxes and then the effect on child health and achievement. There are also uh, sort of notable studies that look at the long-term impacts of cigarette taxes. Some of these uh, studies, just Friedson and Reese have a number of papers on this, focus on teenage taxes. So teen taxes uh, targeting, uh, target sort of a more price sensitive uh, age group. And so teenagers who face higher cigarette taxes may then be disrupted from smoking in adulthood. Um, and so we're focusing sort of all these papers are focusing on direct exposure. We're looking at sort of indirect exposure because this is cigarette taxes faced by the grandmother and the mother is indirectly exposed in utero. Uh, and then finally, another literature that we contribute to is there's a very large literature that looks at the impacts of early childhood health and prenatal health and the long-term impact uh, on adult health. And I would say we kind of add to this literature by really focusing on health behaviors instead of just looking at uh, health human capital. Okay. So why would we expect early life taxes to influence smoking behavior? So I'm going to give you five reasons. Uh, and maybe you can think of more and I'd love to hear them too. These are the five that we've come up with. And they're, they are sort of interrelated, but I think they're all worth mentioning separately. So the first one is that higher cigarette taxes during the mother's development may uh, affect her development. So as I mentioned before, this may impact health and human capital development of the mother in utero, and it may increase infant risk factors like low birth weight. And so just direct exposure to cigarettes uh, in utero may affect the mother's health and human capital. And this is the primary one that we sort of find to be plausible based on the analysis that we do. And then reason number two, so this is related to the first one, but it's a little bit different. In utero exposure to cigarette smoke may affect the individual's general proclivity towards nicotine containing products. And this has mainly been shown in rodents, but it may be generalizable to humans as well, but uh, we can't say conclusively whether that's the case. So if this is a plausible mechanism, then reducing exposure to nicotine during pregnancy may uh, lower overall proclivity towards cigarettes, and it may just help disrupt that generation of smokers through a lower proclivity towards nicotine containing products. Reason number three, higher cigarette taxes were, are also gonna affect the home environment. So the higher cigarette taxes faced by the grandmother may reduce the grandmother's likelihood of smoking. And children who grow up in a household where there is smoking or non-smokers are going to be influenced by their parents into adulthood. And these have been correlational studies, but there are also sort of causal studies looking at the impact of parental health on the impacts on adult children's health behaviors. So there's plausible reason to believe that the observed parent's parental behavior may influence the child's long-term health behaviors. 
And then reason number four is related, but it's sort of the, there's a broader state level culture. So higher cigarette taxes in the state may impact uh, the overall state level culture. So the mother's beliefs about smoking are gonna be shaped by her parents, her peers, her acquaintances. And then there's this general uh, cultural transmission of smoking behaviors that's uh, going on. And so the mother who grows up in a um, sort of more non-smoking oriented environment may have different beliefs and preferences than somebody who's born in a more um, pro-smoking environment. And so childhood exposure to this permissive smoking culture can play a role in shaping health behaviors. And then reason number five uh, is sort of an omitted variable. So cigarette taxes raised during early childhood may be earmarked for public expenditures on education. And so we kind of have to rule this out. Um, and if this is the case, and this is omitted causal factor where the actual impact is going through education rather through the exposure to higher cigarette taxes. And so we test for this in the mechanism section and sort of rule this mechanism out. So to overview the different mechanisms, the the first two are sort of related where we have exposure to cigarettes in utero may impact sort of the development of uh, the fetus and the infant. And then the smoking culture at home and in the state may impact the preferences and the beliefs about smoking. And then finally, there's this omitted variable where uh, we have earmarked expenditures may go into things like education or health spending. Okay, to just show you a graph of cigarette taxes over time. So this is the main sample of the cigarette taxes that we're looking at. Uh, so it goes, the main uh, sample of at consumption taxes is gonna go from 1965 to 2000. And then our contemporary taxes are really on that 2009 through 2020 period. And so the real taxes are plotted in blue. The nominal tax is plotted in red. And then we have the real tax increases, which are plotted in green. And this is a state level average. So the real tax is what we primarily rely on, but we also look at the inflation adjusted real tax increases. And so that's actually looking at um, sort of nominal changes in the tax rate that we inflation adjust. So we look at really in this paper, both the blue line and the green line, and then we don't really look at the red line uh, throughout the paper. Okay. So we are mainly going to rely on the birth certificate records. We are in our primary sample going to focus on the revised version. And that's because smoking is reported at three points in time during pregnancy and then also pre-pregnancy. Whereas the older version just asked a single indicator of whether the mother smoked during pregnancy. So when we go to look at the cohort effects that I mentioned at the beginning, we will add additional years. So we will add, we'll go back all the way to 1996, but in the primary sample, we're focusing on this revision, which is 2009 and onward. We will also add cigarette excise taxes, and this comes from the CDC's tax burden on tobacco. And when we do this, we uh, also add, we use the um, cigarette tax from today, the contemporary cigarette tax. We look at the at conception tax, and then we also, at, uh, in the robustness checks, I'll add the teenage taxes as well, which are based on age 13. And then there's a variety of other data sources that I include, we include in the appendix that are collected by Mike and Serena. It's a very nice full policy data set of state and county level policies. And we include a number of controls that I'll talk about in the empirical strategy, but the sources for those are also in the appendix if you'd like to see them. So in our main outcomes, we're gonna look at prenatal smoking, we'll look at pre-pregnancy smoking, and then we'll look at the quantity of cigarettes. So prenatal smoking is gonna be smoking during any of the three trimesters of pregnancy. And then number of cigarettes is gonna be during the three trimesters of pregnancy. In the robustness, we do look at each trimester individually and our results are pretty much similar across. And then our main sample, we're gonna subset to first deliveries. And the main reason we do this is because we really wanna focus on uh, this only observing mothers once. And then there's also a different socioeconomic effect as you go out to uh, subsequent deliveries. So if we include uh, second time mothers, then we're gonna observe each mother potentially more than once. For instance, in our data set, I will have had two children in our data set, so I would be observed twice. So limiting to first deliveries is going to make sure that you're only observing each person one time. And then as you get out to uh, multiple deliveries, you're gonna have different socioeconomic effects. However, our results are robust to looking at second and third uh, deliveries. So they're pretty similar over um, different parities. Okay, here's an example 
of the 2003 birth certificate revision, which is what our main data is based on. And in the red box, you will see the question asked about cigarettes uh, smoked before, during, and pregnancy. So we have the three months before, we have first three months, second three months, and then the third trimester. And this, uh, so we're gonna use a grouped indicator for uh, the any time during pregnancy, and then we'll look at pre-pregnancy, which is the three months before pregnancy. And then you see on here, there's other information that we use as controls. Okay, so our main empirical strategy, and I'm gonna break after this for questions, but I'll go over this and then stop uh, for questions. So here, we're gonna be looking at individual I residing in County J, and then this is where it gets a little bit um, more complicated than average because we have two states. So we have state C, which is the current state. Uh, and then we have T, who's observed at time T, which is the current time. And this mother is born in SB, which is the birth state. So B stands for birth state. So again, we have individual I residing in County J in the current resident state at time T, who was born in state SB. So that's the birth state. Um, so we're looking at smoking behavior for individual I, and then we're looking at mainly this early life tax, which is based on the mother's birth state and then the conception year of the mother. So we don't have the precise conception year. So we use the current time minus the mother's age minus one. And then we also add these demographic and policy controls. So we, in our main demographic controls, we include race and ethnicity. We choose not to control for education and payer status, so uh, insurance information, because these may be bad controls or they may be endogenously determined, which we talk about in the mechanism section. However, I will say our res results even get a little bit stronger if we include those as controls. So including only race and ethnicity does not affect our results. We also inclu include a number of tobacco control policies. Most notably in our main specification, we control for the contemporary state level cigarette tax but we control for a number of other tobacco control policies as well, which are listed here. And then we include general policy controls as well. Um, so we have a, a host of uh, controls and we, both, we show both the specification with and without controls and they're fairly, fairly similar. Then we also include fixed effects and trends, which I'll go over individually. So we include the current state, which is uh, SC, the current state, the resident state, and then the birth state of the mother, which is SB. We include the infant month of conception and then the mother's conception year fixed effects. And then as I mentioned before, we include this linear time trend which is based on the mother's birth state and the mother's conception year. And this is to control for sort of general changes that occur over time uh, where you may have a change, just a general change in smoking behavior over time. And then we have the standard error which we are gonna cluster at the birth state but our results are robust to clustering at the resident state. So I'll go ahead and pause here. And I think the moderator is going to take questions. Thank you, Lauren. I think let's turn to our discussion today, Dr. Catherine oh, McLean, see whether she has any comments or questions. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Lauren, for this really great talk. Um, I guess I just have a couple of questions, both one's more empirical and one's more about your, your linkages between your conceptual linkages. So I guess I'll start with the um, empirical question. I think from what you're saying, you're going to control for these early life taxes, and then you're going to later on control for the teen taxes. Um, I guess my thinking is, this is sort of, when, when you showed in your graph, the taxes are going up over time. So this is not something like, say, economic conditions, which are going to be transient. It's not kind of when you get, when the tax goes up, it continues to go up. So I'm wondering, should you be thinking or should we be worried about a cumulative exposure over some period of time that you're only really controlling for a couple of taxes? And maybe that's just picking up this correlation that we see over time. Um, how do I think about that? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And one thing that we do to address that is in the additional robustness text, which I don't think I have here today, but they look pretty much as the same as what I'm gonna show. Uh, we check whether the tax increases. So these are the unit increases, the inflation adjusted unit increases. Um, basically what the tax was yesterday um, subtracted from today is gonna to be whatever that increase is. Uh, we look at those increases, which I think are gonna avoid that kind of compounding effect that you talk about. Um, where there's a, those are sort of more exogenous. 
We also look at an event study where we're kind of considering all future and past tax increases over time. And I think that will address um, some of what you're mentioning. Does that get at it? I think so. I think that I think that, that would that makes me feel a little more comfortable than maybe just the early taxes, but I I'd still I think it's kind of hard to model that like continuous exposure over the life course. But thank you for saying that first that that's confirmatory. Another question I have is um, the, the, the extent to which the tax is passed on uh, to consumers is based on the pass through rate. Do you have any sense of whether this pass through rate is stable or not stable over your study period? Uh, I think Mike would have a better expertise on that. So maybe he should answer that in the chat. All right, I'll let, I'll let Mike handle that one. Thank you. Um, just going to your, your rationale, and I really like how you laid out these different reasons why we might think that there's this linkages, we might expect these linkages. Um, one thought I have is when I'm thinking back to like the almond curry type of model that you've, you've cited some work by almond, but um, I'm thinking, are we capturing, what do you expect that we'd be capturing something like a story about a calling of the weakest, of the weakest so maybe the, the babies that are not observed potentially might have been, might have smoked or what do you, do you have any thoughts about that? Or, or I guess the, any, the, anything about the, um, the moms that are having the babies, like they may not have survived. Some babies might not survive because of the smoking of the mom and we're not seeing those people in your data set. Yeah, I think that's a really good point uh, that we should probably mention. I'm not, so I've dealt with this in previous papers. I haven't talked about it so much in this paper. Um, I think that it could be happening, um, but it's very hard to observe. Uh, yes. And I also think it's probably pretty small um, so we're still going to get a lot of effect from like the low birth weight or the low uh, sort of outcome babies. And I think, I don't know that, so for my previous uh, looking at this, and I haven't looked at it in this context, it seems like there isn't a lot that you can do for this besides mention it. But I think that's a possibility. I, maybe we can talk offline. I do think that okay. Almond, Almond has done some work. It's kind of tricky, but you can do a little bit of work on this. Um, one last question, then I'll let the, the audience provide their questions. I'm only going to push on you on this because I have made the opposite argument on one of the rationales. So when you cite the rodent studies, um, I know that I have those, do we, how, do we really think that we can learn at this point in time a substantial amount about the impact of nicotine on brain development from rodents to humans. I guess I've made the opposite argument that perhaps it's not generalizable. So I just love to hear you speak on that. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's totally valid. And I think that really the main mechanism we're kind of like relying on is really the economics literature has really focused on the health and human capital effects of uh, smoking and pregnancy. And I would say we're kind of our conclusions are more around that, but it's probably worthwhile to mention the potential effects on nicotine exposure. But I think the mechanism we're really like saying this is the main mechanism that we think is plausible. There may be others, but from what we've tested, this looks the most plausible. It looks like it's coming through sort of early childhood health and human capital development, which then uh, goes on into adulthood. I don't think that our conclusions are heavily reliant on the nicotine receptors, but I think it's worth mentioning. Fair. I guess one more question I'll tack on. And I know you. Uh, you're going to talk more about this later on about, about the earmarking of the funds for education and so on and so forth. And I think you, you've alluded that you don't, you do not find that to be an important mechanism. Just one other thought is like, perhaps though the, um, it's just simply, and maybe this is what you're thinking, but perhaps that spending is simply just not effective and it's not really, so it's not that it wasn't earmarked um, and there, were, there weren't funds put away, but it's just that this month, this, the spending was not effective for the outcomes that you're examining. Yes, I think one thing that I've been thinking that we need to add before going further with this paper is looking at actual spending as an outcome rather than just controlling for it and seeing if early life taxes are affecting funding as an outcome. I think that sounds like a really interesting way to go. So uh, thank you, I have no more questions. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, we don't see any um, audience questions yet, but I just want to point out that um, I know that the state of California has their tobacco related disease research program that's funded by uh, tobacco taxes. So just to add on, you know, uh, Catherine questions, uh, last question regarding how they, how the taxes are spent or earmarked to, to support education or like, to support um, tax, like other policies or the research on reducing tobacco. So <laughs> just some thoughts. Okay, thank you. Come. Yeah, you can please continue because we don't see any uh, all these questions yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll go right into the results. 
So as I mentioned, we're really looking at early life taxes and the outcome is smoking behavior. So we have the at conception cigarette tax, and then we're looking at uh, pre-pregnancy smoking, prenatal smoking, and then the cigarettes smoked per day. So the highlighted results that I have there are um, any pre-pregnancy smoking. So that's the three months prior to pregnancy. And you see here that there's a negative and significant effect. And these are reported in elasticities. We also have the linear results in the back. Um, and so at conception taxes without controls, so there's just the baseline fixed effects, it's negative and significant. And then we add controls in column two, um, and it's pretty similar to column one. And then finally, we add the linear trends in column three. And so this is where you sort of see the magnitude decline a little bit, but uh, the significance sort of increases. So maybe it becomes a little bit more precise, but it's pretty similar across the first three columns. Then we look at any prenatal smoking. So this is smoking during any of the three trimesters of pregnancy. And so you see uh, the first column number four is just the baseline fixed effects. And then in column five, we add controls. And then in column six, we add the linear trends. And so again, you see sort of a similar pattern where the magnitude falls in column six, um, but it becomes a little bit more significant, but it's statistically significant in all the specifications. And then finally, we have prenatal uh, cigarettes smoked per day. And so we see a similar pattern here. So all of our main results are showing that early life cigarette taxes, again, this is the level of the real cigarette tax, that they are uh, reducing pre-pregnancy smoking and then prenatal smoking and also reducing the prenatal cigarettes smoked per day. Okay, so I'm gonna go into the robustness and I'm gonna show you similar tables to this. Uh, and so what I'm going to add, though, is what I already mentioned. So teenage taxes have been shown to be quite important and also contemporary taxes. So we are including contemporary taxes in this specification in the middle columns, but we are not including the uh, controls for teenage taxes. So we're going to add that next. And I'm going to also show you the results uh, for the contemporary taxes as well. And that's going to be our first robustness. So I'm going to repeat this table uh, with these added taxes. So this is repeating the exact same table that I just had, but now I'm adding teenage taxes and present day taxes. So this is present day, meaning the taxes that were in place when the current infant uh, was conceived. Then at the top, we still have those at conception taxes uh, for the mother. And then we've added these teenage taxes, which are based on age 13. The results are really similar, whether we use 14, 15. Um, but what we see here is that really, only at conception cigarette taxes appear to be um, explaining smoking behavior and teenage taxes and present day taxes don't appear uh, to be um, as important. So present day taxes are actually higher. So higher present day taxes are associated with um, a higher likelihood of smoking during pregnancy. Whereas at conception taxes, higher at conception taxes of the mother are gonna be associated with lower smoking during pregnancy. And then teenage taxes don't look like they have a significant effect in the full specification, but it's notable that the coefficient is positive rather than negative, which is what we'd expect. So this is a little bit surprising. So what we do next is we look at whether this is due to some measurement error because teenage taxes are a little bit harder to measure with the records that we have, with the administrative records that we have because we're only observing the mother's birth state and then her current residence state. But the teenage years are obviously happening in the middle. So um, we are basing the teenage years on the birth state, but it may be a little bit better to subsample to only mothers who stay in their birth state for their first delivery. And then we're probably gonna be more likely to have um, the correct teen state where we're not, we're assuming basically that mothers aren't leaving and then coming back uh, for their first delivery as it's at least going to reduce the measurement error that may be present in this table here. So this is the table that subsets to never movers and you see that it's pretty similar. So early life cigarette taxes is robust to subsetting to never movers. And then again, we see not really a clear, um, negative effects between teenage taxes and present day taxes. So the coefficient's positive, meaning that higher taxes are linked to a higher likelihood of smoking during pregnancy. And then the coefficient on early life taxes is sort of stable and um, 
the, the significance doesn't really change. Something else that's really beneficial about this table is that this is saying that never movers, so mothers who face the same tax regime in early life and adulthood, it's not, our results are not driven by changes in the tax regime because maybe there's something going on where mothers who move and there's like a different tax regime between early life and later life that could be driving our main results, but this says that that is not the, the main sort of driving mechanism. Then um, we show the main results again, only adding teenage taxes without contemporary taxes. So maybe there's a bunch of correlation between these taxes over time. So we subset um, or we, we include the main sample with only teenage taxes and not contemporary taxes. And again, we see that early life taxes kind of have the same magnitude, the same significance, but teenage taxes aren't uh, reducing smoking behavior prenatally. And then one last robustness check, we include each of them individually again to sort of rule out this possibility of correlation and the taxes over time um, messing up the effect. And we see that at conception taxes are clearly um, associated with lower adult smoking prenatally, whereas teenage taxes and president day taxes don't appear to be um, changing smoking behavior. If anything, they look positively related to smoking. Okay, and then uh, another robustness check we do is we look at the real tax at each age. So I told you here that basically um, we have the at conception tax. So this is when the mother's born and then we have the teenage tax and then we have today's taxes. So in this next graph, I'm basically repeating that specification but I'm looking individually at taxes at each year of life. So right here is age zero. So this is the mother's birth year. Here is age one. And then negative one is gonna be the conception year. And then negative two is the year before conception. So we see that the main effect is coming from tax, tax increases that occur just before the mother is conceived. And then maybe they have an effect up to age one. But there doesn't look like there's an effect of cigarette taxes throughout childhood or the teen years. So this is again, looking at taxes at age 13, age 14 and age 15. Um, and if we took this out farther, it would look similar for over older ages. And then as I mentioned to Catherine and the questions is we have the same graph in panel B looking at the cigarette tax increases where instead of having the real cigarette tax level, which is presented here in panel A, we just look at the increase um, and we inflation adjust that increase. And that's sort of uh, taking out this potential correlation and just the size of the cigarette tax over time. And so we see a very similar pattern um, with the real cigarette tax increase. So these are the other robustness checks that we do. So I just mentioned this one. So we look at real cigarette taxes, tax increases at each age and the graph looks very similar. Then we also do an event study of cigarette tax increases relative to the mother's birth year. So that's basically including all past and future cigarette tax increases in the same specification. Whereas panel uh, or the last graph I showed you and then point one is looking at individually, what is the effect at each age? The event study is including all of those increases in a single specification and the results look robust to the event study. Then we look at the effect over trimester. So we look at the effect in the first trimester, the second trimester and the third trimester and it looks pretty similar or symmetric throughout the three trimesters. We subset to different balance panels and then we use an alternative clustering of the standard errors. So we cluster standard errors at the residence state. Okay, and the mechanisms for the main effect, I'm gonna go over these very briefly um, because I just wanna go into the cohort effect and then conclude. Uh, but I know Catherine mentioned that she'd like to see <laughs> some of these uh, looking at the sort of earmarked uh, expenditure. It is in the paper and I'll add the outcome, but I'm not gonna go over the tables here, but we find the main effect is really driven by this human capital. So improved human capital and socioeconomic status. So higher cigarette taxes in the year leading up to the mother's in utero exposure is gonna increase college degree attainment, um, make the mother more likely to be married at the first delivery and then reduce WIC receipt. And we also see multi-generational effects on health. So we see the mother's health improves and then the infant health improves as well. And again, these are in the paper but I'm not gonna go over them in the presentation for the sake of time. So the way that I wanna really conclude is talking about this cohort specific effect. So we showed you in the main results that early life taxes look quite important and teenage and contemporary taxes don't look quite as important. And this may be confusing because there's been prior work that has looked 
at contemporary taxes during pregnancy and shown that they do impact smoking behavior. And then there's also the Friedson and Reese papers that look at the long-term effect of teenage taxes. So why are our results different? So we wanted to figure this out. So we looked back in the data. So we go back to 1996 and we kind of pull the full span of 1996 to 2020. And we look at sort of when did contemporary and teenage taxes become less important? And when did early life uh, taxes arise in the data as important for predicting smoking behavior? So we're gonna add the unrevised birth certificate records and look at when uh, cigarette taxes, contemporary cigarette taxes sort of lose their bite, um, which is a prior uh, American Journal of Health Economics paper that um, shows that cigarette taxes in recent years may have lost their bite. Okay, so this is looking at 1996 to 2005, and this is our main specification. If you think back to the table where we had early life cigarette taxes, teenage taxes, and contemporary taxes, we're basically looking at that same specification where each of these columns is looking at, at early life teen taxes and contemporary taxes. And all that's different between these columns is we're dropping a year. So we start over 19, 1998 and prior, we start with 1996 through 1997, and then we add an additional year in each of these columns. So you see in the data that includes 1996 and 1997, present day taxes and teenage taxes, higher present day and teenage taxes have a negative effect on smoking behavior and pregnancy. When we add 1998, you see a similar reduction um, and there's no effect of early life taxes. And this sort of negative effect of present day taxes and teenage taxes continues all the way until 2002 and then it looks like all three taxes fail to predict smoking behavior. So we see that present day taxes and teenage taxes are becoming less important around 2002 and early life taxes are not producing uh, any change in smoking behavior during this period. Then we go back to sort of closer to our main sample, which is uh, 2002 to 2020, and we drop a year um, between each of these columns. And we say, when does early life taxes appear as important in our data? When does that start to arise in our data? So we start with 2002 to 2020. And then in each of these columns, we drop a year from the data. So it looks like early life taxes start to become important around 2006 and onward, where present day and teenage taxes have no um, effect on smoking behavior. Early life taxes appear to arise as important around 2006 and continue until um, when I stopped dropping data, which is 2012. So it looks like there may have been this shift in um, policy influence that occurred somewhere in the mid 2000s where present day taxes and teenage taxes are becoming less important and early life taxes have sort of arisen as an important policy tool. So to conclude, uh, our primary finding is that we find a long-term link between mother's exposure to higher or in utero early life taxes and later life adult prenatal smoking. Um, the importance of early life taxes holds over a variety of specifications. We use an event study, we look at um, just discrete tax increases and we look at taxes over all ages and it looks uh, robust to our main sample. And we find our most plausible mechanisms are human capital development and socioeconomic status. And we also find multi-generational effects uh, for third generation infant exposure. We also find two notable cohort effects in the data. So we find contemporary and teenage taxes um, were most influential in sort of the late 1990s and the early 2000s. And early life taxes sort of only arose as an important policy tool after 2006. So early life taxes, oh, it looks like I didn't correctly do this. There we go. Uh, are most influential over the past 15 years. Okay, so what are the general conclusions as I have one minute left um, from these findings? So we uh, find similar results to related studies, which is that contemporary taxes may have lost their bite in recent years. So really we find that after roughly 2002, 2003, there's not a, a clear effect of contemporary taxes on prenatal smoking. And um, this sort of, leads to this interesting conclusion, which is that public policies, particularly cigarette taxes, may have cohort specific effects. So today, pregnant women look less responsive to contemporary and teenage taxes. And this may be because marginal smokers quit earlier in life or they never started to begin with. And so the remaining smokers may just be more committed and they have more inelastic demand. 
Um, and so what we find is that over the past 15 years, early life cigarette taxes have really been more influential than uh, contemporary or teenage taxes. And those taxes were really more influential in the late 1990s and early 2000s. So we also in this paper, another important sort of takeaway is we demonstrate the persistent effect of public policy, particularly cigarette taxes on long-term health behaviors, which again aligns with some of the previous literature such as um, Friedson and Reese that look at the long-term effect of teenage taxes. So public policies um, may have both cohort specific effects but they also have long-term effects on health behaviors. So I'll conclude there and I thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Laura. That was fantastic. So um, we have one question from the audience. So Catherine, can we answer that first and then go to you? Thank you. Um, so Mamat Ergen asked, how did the relationship differ by race, ethnicity, and sexual and gender minority status separately and in combinations? So we can't, I don't think, I don't think I know how to look at sexual minorities or uh, gender. Um, there's no gender reported to my knowledge on the birth certificate. We look, we don't find um, big differences by race either. Um, we've taken those out. Uh, I think we do find the main effect is primarily driven by those with um, less than college education, but we've taken out most of the uh, heterogeneity um, in our analysis. Thank you. Um, so let's turn to Catherine to see if she has any comments. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lauren. This was a really fascinating paper. I, I so enjoyed the presentation. Um, I just have a few questions. One is, um, I take your point that just generally there could be cohort specific effects and maybe policies change, but my looking at the graph where you show kind of where the bite is lost, it seems to be quite relatively abrupt at 2006. Do you have any thoughts specifically, you know, why it seems to be such an abrupt shift? So or maybe I'm just maybe I'm just reading it incorrectly. <laughs> no, I think that I think both kind of like appear. I would say the early life taxes, it does, there is like sort of like it kind of the, the coefficient does like sort of peter out. But with the early life taxes, I think we talked about like potential like big changes in the policies, like the master settlement agreement in 2000. But we haven't found anything that like really aligns with the change. Um, I will say that the the years that we find where teen, like contemporary and teen taxes become less important, I think those years do align with the Hansen paper. Um, so it looks like those do kind of align with other papers. I don't know that we have an explanation for why, but I think it's um, it aligns with related work. I, I think it's really interesting and I'm, I, I'm glad you're thinking about that. I think it would be really even just kind of descriptively or conceptually to like have some arguments about why that sh kind of abrupt shift is there. So I'm, I'm glad you're thinking about that. I think that's really interesting. Um, I guess uh, I was also wondering you, so you have a continuous treatment and I know those are trickier. I, I work on continuous treatments as well. So I know they're challenging, but have you thought about um, trying to apply some of the newer methods uh, like fuzzy DID or something like that, to just even as a robustness check to maybe show that the results are, are robust because we do know that when you move into the continuous treatments, even with the continuous treatment staggered rollout, like that's a really complicated issue. Um, and I'm wondering if you've thought about any of those methods. We've thought about it. We have not uh, included it in the paper as, at a, as of right now, but we've definitely talked about it. Okay, well, yes, I'll see. I'll be interested to see what you do because I too am <laughs> facing these challenges. Um, another thought is, I think I should think about these estimates as TO, uh, they are ITTs, intent, uh, intent to treats. Have you thought about how big these effects would be if you think about the TOT, the treatment on the treated? Because I think your baseline there, you know, it's like 10% of women are, are smoking while they're pregnant. Have you thought about how big those TOTs would be? No, I haven't. That's a really good question. I should add that too. Thank you. No, I yeah, I think though. It, might just, it might be just inter, uh, interesting to see. Um, and I guess, uh, thinking about you know, this new environment that we're in, um, how do you think that, do you think e-cigarettes may have, just asking you to think, you know, think ahead and may, maybe it's just, we don't know enough, but do you think that we might see kind of like these similar patterns in future generations with e-cigarette taxes? Well, I think one thing that we mentioned in the paper is whether e-cigarettes are also playing into this, like whether there's like a substitution effect, which we can't observe, um, where there are these sort of like long-term persistent effects of taxes and are people, like one question we'd like to answer is are people switching between products? But I don't think we can in the in the paper, but I think also sort of the 
going back to your main question, the main policy conclusion would be that there are um, really cohort specific effects of policies, which I think other papers have found as well. So I would expect that to apply in other areas. Uh, that sounds great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I feel like I have another question, but I do not seem to be able to read my own writing. So I apologize about that, but thanks so much. Really enjoyed this paper. Thank you. And I appreciate your questions. They've given me a lot to think about. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't see any um, audience questions, but I think my, myself have a question. Um, so I, I feel that um, I guess the federal tax was significantly increased in 2009. And uh, do you think you know that may explain partially what you observe here? Um, because the added tax would be like so high and the, the smoking problems has been you know, heating historically low and it's been trending down in 2000s. Um, so I don't know, just just some some random thoughts. <laughs> yeah. The results, yeah. So we use the state plus the federal tax in our main specification, yeah. but then we, yeah, we include the state fixed effects, which I think should take some of that out. Um, but like that big jump, you do see it in the graph. Um, and I, I don't think that's affecting the cohort specific changes though, because I think most of those cohort specific changes have happened before 2009. Yeah, thank you. I just got a, a note that there is a question from Justin White in the chat. So um, he said he will buy that after 2006, the remaining smokers may have more inelastic demand, but why might uh, they be more responsive to in utero taxes? Can you say more about possible determinants of this cohort effect? Thank you. Yeah, so our thought was that we were really um, thinking that higher cigarette taxes in utero um, may have disrupted like this generation of smokers. So they're never observed to begin with. So we have this like period of taxes that were higher and most of the cohort effect probably is coming from uh, the 1980s and 1990s where we had higher cigarette taxes during that period. And that cohort is sort of um, the marginal smokers have been removed from that cohort. And that's why we see uh, the effect of early life taxes uh, today starting to show up which it wasn't there for prior cohorts. Thank you. Um... I guess, you know, I, uh, I sent in a question earlier um, regarding the comparison between the, the elasticity estimates you found um, and also the price elasticity estimates that we know uh, in the literature. And I think, you know, it's really in line with, uh, with what we know about price elasticity and tax elasticity. So can you say, um, speak, speak about, you know, whether this is what you would expect and uh, whether the current, uh, I guess, the press estimates, estimates using the current taxes are really capturing, um, you know, the maybe the taxes that were exposed before uh, when they were young, or you know, whether you know we are estimating the elasticity estimates, um, maybe uh, with some um, uh, omitted variables. So thank you. Yeah. So I think um, we compare our linear effects to what Friedson and Reese find, which is another paper looking at long-term exposure. And our estimates are a little bit smaller than theirs. And we, um, we kind of posit that that's probably because um, we're looking at indirect exposure. So based on that, because our estimates are a little bit smaller from my uh, last reading of their paper, I was assuming that they were pretty um, aligned with expectation, maybe a little bit smaller, and that's due to the indirect exposure. But there could be other admitted variables. We do try to test for that um, in the robustness. And then, as I said, we need to add them as outcomes as well. Um, but there could be other omitted variables, and I'm happy to test anything that anyone wants to email me, and I'll, I'll test them out, add some, if the data is available. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so there is an audience question regarding how you define smoking, whether that includes vaping. Um, it, is would, not, it does not include vaping. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry. I have now, I haven't been able to uh, read my writing. Is it possible to ask one more question? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's have time. Thank you. Penmanship is not uh, a strength of mine. I guess my question is just sort of the selection of the data. Um, I'm wondering, why do you go with the revised birth records um, versus using the longer time series as the primary sample? Because I think what I heard you say is that your results are pretty stable across, like, you know, looking within the trimester, um, you kind of, my take of your findings that it looks pretty similar in terms of qualitatively across the three different measures. And those to me seem to be the big benefits of the revised first records versus the long, using the longer time series. And when you go into that longer time series, you kind of are able to maybe overlap more so with periods that I think like the Friedson et al. papers are 
um, examining. Is there a reason? I guess I'm not under, I'm not seeing the specific value of the revised birth records versus the longer series, given your research question and the commonality across the different yeah. trimesters and the different measures. So originally, the reason we started with the revised records is originally we were interested in controlling for insurance status, and we wanted to look at the three points in pregnancy and see if there was any um, different effects, for instance, like controlling for increases that, uh, in contemporary taxes that occurred during pregnancy. And since we didn't find much there, and then we ended up dropping the insurance as a control, we now use it as an outcome. So I think there's some benefit in having consist, or sorry, as a mechanism. So I think there's some benefit of having consistency for the mechanism section. And that was just sort of how we had started. And then we really just expanded to look at the cohort specific effect recently. Um, so adding the unrevised data, but I think there is some inconsistency across outcomes when we add the unrevised data. So that's why we had um, started with the revised records um, that started in 2009. Okay, I guess to me, I just think that longer time series is just so interesting to kind of look at those uh, different cohort effects, but uh, you know, it's your paper and there's many ways, many pathways to success, but that just seems really quite interesting to me. And we do, I mean, we do have the cohort effects in there. So it is, it's in there. We just, it's not, we don't start with those. So it's kind of like, why aren't our results aligning with the, the literature ending? Fair, fair. Thank you. Thank you. I think we are about time. Thank you, Lauren. That was fantastic. Um, I'll pass this to Allison to conclude today's seminar. Thank you. Yes, I think we're out of time. So I wanted to say thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. And finally, thank you to the audience of 110 people for your participation today. Everyone have a top, top's notch weekend.